There are a shocking number of idiots out there who think story doesn't matter in fighting games or that Mortal Kombat didn't take its storytelling seriously until 2011. These people are cretinous buffoons who should be ostracised from society for their stupidity. Series co-creator John Tobias, who was the lead storyteller from 1992 to 2000, created prequel comic tie-ins for MK1 and 2 to help set up the plots for those games. This was decades before their partnership with DC Comics and the rise of online shopping. These were indie comics released in full colour that people had to send away for. There was no big publisher backing them, no easy online distribution, and they weren't made to go inside some kind of collector's edition because these were made for the arcade releases, not the home releases. They went to great lengths to set up the world and its characters, and yet so many fans write them off completely because they got into the series with the god-awful Netherrealm games and blindly accept what Pat from the best friend said about the 3D era being bad despite never looking at it themselves and believe that higher production values indicate a better story because more polys is more emotions. Philistines, the lot of them. Now that I've got my prerequisite rant out of the way, let's talk about the MK1 comic. I need to open by saying to anyone who thinks this comic is irrelevant due to MK2011 rebooting the franchise, 2011 is an in-continuity reboot that alters events from the opening ceremony onwards which begins on page 13. Everything before that should still be the same. Do not make me make a video about this. Now, one detail rarely gone into these days for some reason is that the tournament was run by the Shaolin, hence the presence of said monks in the courtyard. One of the three grandmasters died mysteriously and Shang Tsung took his place before presumably offing the other two once Goro was established as the champion. Speaking of Shang Tsung, he needs to devour souls because of a curse put on him by the gods. Why they did this is never specified. That detail is rarely mentioned now, somewhat implying that he does it by choice to extend his lifespan, not because he needs to or he'll rapidly age and die. It's why the Solnado Quan Chi offered him in Deadly Alliance was such a big deal. Next, we see Liu Kang asking to compete in the tournament. He received an invitation to do so, but this idea was never expanded upon. Who invites the fighters other than Shang Tsung? Why would he invite such proficient warriors? As an offering to Khan, perhaps? Khan isn't once mentioned in MK1, and Outworld only comes up in Goro's bio to say where he's from. There are no stakes beyond Shang Tsung keeping control of the tournament if he wins. We get a scene of Johnny Cage with his agent and secretary to establish how sketchy the tournament is. It's not gone into in the comic, but Johnny's goal is to prove that his moves are real, which even in the 90s would be pretty easy to do. It's why the movie and legacy changed it so that his career is just in the shitter instead. After that, we jump to a few miles away where Sonya is pursuing Kano. Kano's goal is to kill Shang Tsung and loot his island. That's pretty far removed from the more modern version where he's already working for the sorcerer and planning to sell weapons to him. After causing an explosion, Kano leaps onto the boat to escape. We then learn that he is a fan of Johnny's. I think that makes him the only one until Fujin and MK11, if the leaks are anything to go by. Shang Tsung invites Raiden to compete because originally he wasn't the protector of Earthrealm, he was just some asshole thunder god. Him competing in the tournament is no longer canonical since he's retconned role in the storyline. Liu Kang helps Johnny fight off Kano and some others, setting the stage for them becoming the protagonists of the story. It's hard to recall nowadays, but in MK1, all the playable characters are from Earthrealm. None of them are working for Outworld, suggesting that no Outworlders actually compete other than Goro. But with the modern Earthrealm vs Outworld scenario, they should all be on the same side. The fight is observed by Sub-Zero, who is here to assassinate Shang Tsung. We never did learn who hired the Lin Kuei to do this, it's just stated to be one of Shang Tsung's wealthy enemies, whoever that might be. This has been completely inverted with MK2011, where Sub-Zero is actively working for Shang Tsung to assassinate Earthrealmers. It's fucking dumb. There are actually multiple ships heading for the island here, not just the one departing from Hong Kong. You have to wonder where they all came from if the closest one to the States was in Hong Kong, since that's where Johnny gets on. Sonya is captured and has to compete or her squad mates will die. They don't show up in the MK2 comic, so they probably die anyway. As Goro declares a start to the tournament, the story ends and the comic moves on to a bio section, detailing a number of interesting facts about the characters that were mostly never brought up again, despite there being quite a lot you can do with these ideas. So let's go through these bios one at a time in the only true canonical order. Kano. Other than Raiden, Shang Tsung and Goro, who are well beyond a normal human lifespan, Kano is actually the oldest competitor at 35. 
And before the movie, Kano wasn't Australian or British as Goddard apparently actually played him. He was an American orphan raised in Japan, hence the Japanese name Kano. This backstory could still be utilised if we say the Black Dragon member that originally recruited him was Australian and Kano lived there for a few years and picked up the accent. Liu Kang. To start with something not too notable, Liu Kang is the youngest competitor in the tournament, but every real fan knows that thanks to Born in China. What is worth noting though is that he does have a brother, like in the movie. But the brother here is named Chao, not Chan, and his whereabouts are unknown. More significantly, you may notice the names of his parents and brother. Li Kang, Lin Kang, and Chao Kang. Liu Kang's name was originally in Western naming order with Kang as the family name. This presumably extends to Kung Lao, meaning Kung Jin should actually be Jin Lao. Crazy, right? And what's even more crazy than that? He catches fish. Shocking. Raiden. Raiden is seven feet tall. Christ. And he weighs 350 pounds. The ninjas are 6'2 and they're only 210 pounds. Are his bones covered in adamantium or is he just Fat Thor from Avengers Endgame? He also has black hair, which the movie changed to white, which carried over to the games with Deadly Alliance. Thunder God is listed as his occupation. What's the hourly rate for that, do you reckon? He also has no eyes, apparently. I guess Deadly Alliance Kenshi got to him. Johnny Cage. Please welcome Mr. John Carlton, the blue-eyed actor from Venice, California. These are actual lyrics from Prepare Yourself, the opening track from Mortal Kombat, the album from which the Techno Syndrome theme song originated. It basically covers half of his bio, honestly. Son of Robert and Rose Carlton, brother of Rebecca Carlton, and ex-husband of Cindy Ford. There's a lot you could do with this stuff, but no MK Media ever brought this up. He never mentions his previous marriage, his shitty career is never attributed to his bitch of an ex-wife and her extensive LA connections in the movies, and Cassie never once mentions her aunt Becky. Wasted Potential starring Johnny Cage coming summer 2020? Probably not, no. Scorpion. Scorpion's eyes are listed as varies despite just being white like Raiden's, which I guess proves that Raiden actually doesn't have eyes? Maybe it's meant to be like Thor's glowy eyes from the MCU. Scorpion is also the exact same height, weight and age as Sub-Zero, probably Reptile 2 aside from the age. They're close to Johnny's stats, but not quite, so it's probably more just because they're palette swaps and less a nod to them all being played by Daniel Pacina. Which makes me wonder if any of these stats are based on the actual stats of the actors who played the characters in MK1. I don't think Richard Vizio was 35, but you never know. Sub-Zero. Much like Scorpion, we know very little about Sub-Zero's life here. We don't know his name, he lives in China and might be Chinese, but no one knows. I get that they're masked assassins, but why leave so much mystery here? Also, it says he has no family, which proves the common fan assertion that Bihan never liked his brother, even though there has never been any evidence to support that. F -f -f Fans are dumb. Sonya. I'm not sure if it's just how her hair is coloured or if she dyed it, but Sonya is apparently a brunette. It doesn't say she dyed it, which you'd think it would since it says Scorpion's eyes vary to indicate his eyes weren't always white. This is presumably not the case anymore though, given her daughter's presumed natural blonde hair, but it's an interesting detail. Not quite as interesting as Daniel, her dead twin brother though. Why that never came up again, I'll never know, since it could be brought up as part of her motivation to kill Kano, since the games have never actually given her a reason. Her father, who is the same rank as Jax incidentally, perhaps suggesting he's a friend of Herman's, is one of the few details in these bios to be brought up again, though his appearance in her 2011 ending claims he's dead. He could have died in the invasion, but it's probably just another retcon. Mama Erica goes unmentioned though. Also, Sonya is apparently from Texas, and yet she's never been given that god-awful accent Erin Black got saddled, haha, with an MK11. <laughs> Goro is actually a fifth of Kitana's age. You wouldn't think that, you kind of get the impression that he is ancient, but in the grand scheme of things, he's not been around that long. He's seemingly one of the younger Outworlders. King Gorbak was first mentioned here along with Queen Mai, who was never brought up again. Even after her husband died and her son lost his arms, she didn't step up to rule the Shokan and just gave the job to Shiva of all fucking people. He's also got seven wives. Dude has an actual harem and it's never brought up, even by woke nether realm to demonize the bad man for his sexual deviance. There are some really interesting details in here that could be mined for plot elements. I myself use them in MK Chronicles sometimes, like Goro, Seven Wives, Johnny's family and ex-wife, and I've got a few ideas for Kano and Sonya from this. If this isn't proof that Tobias cared more about fleshing out the world and characters than anyone who's written for Netherrealm, I don't know what is. Also, Tobias's comics are a million times better than Sean Kittleson's run. That's just objective facts. If you liked this video, why not subscribe and support me on Patreon like these fine people here? 
If not, then make sure to share it with your enemies so they can suffer along with you. Today's recommended video is Mortal Kombat Sometimes Has More On Its Mind by Jack, which touches on a number of subjects regarding Netherrealm's failure to deliver on the potential of the series' story, with Sub-Zero, the two monks, and the restrictions of game development as main talking points. Good stuff!